a little bit difficult to follow that one. Um, working with service design, you kind of, over time, I think, turn into like a, um, a bit of an ethnographer. So I don't know about you, but for me, I really can't go to a hospital or take my kids to a hospital without examining, observing, noticing how usually they do fail at care. Uh, and actually, one of the, the books I've written about design and innovation in the public sector, uh, I was uh, with my daughter in hospital, uh, and when I was writing the book, I brought an, uh, a laptop, and I wrote a great case example about how not to do service design in healthcare. So what I'll talk about is, is a perspective on design or two perspectives on design, where one is very, very macro, and one is actually maybe more micro. Um, and the context for me, or for us at the Danish Design Center, is this. It is, how do you take something, a welfare state, a Scandinavian a society, and somehow make it a lot better? A lot better for business, a lot better for people a lot better for uh, a society at large. Uh, this was a front page uh, a while ago. Uh, and uh, on the one hand, you kind of uh, worry that this is the, the image of, uh, of, of Denmark abroad. In fact, uh, I don't know what to worry most about, that the image of Denmark is uh, designer chairs or it's, uh, it's Vikings. Both are slightly problematic and not the whole picture. Uh, but, but context does matter, of course. Uh, and so let me just say a little bit about what, uh, what we're experiencing and what I'm, I'm sort of thinking about or what we're thinking about at the, at the DDC uh, about the context uh, to just start zooming in a little bit on, on what we're then doing. So something's going on in the world, and a lot of people are talking about how uh, our world is obviously designed. In fact, it's so designed by now that uh, geologists are discussing whether we should rename the era in which we live to the Anthropocene the Anthropocene being the age of man, meaning that the world is no longer natural, that in fact the world is so designed and so impacted by human activity over the last few hundred years that our world is becoming artificial. Uh, so we've, uh, we've simply impacted the geology of our planet so much that it's, it's become a designed planet. Something's also going on with the world of design, and I think just the last two keynotes were just excellent examples of that, how design is, is, is changing and how design is finding uh, positions within large corporations, uh, within uh, healthcare systems, uh, sometimes uh, central positions and sometimes, at least in the beginning, maybe more marginal positions. So this change of how design uh, impacts our world, I think you might call diffusion. Uh, one of uh, the scholars in design that I uh, admire very much is um, Ezio Mancini, uh, and Ezio talks about expert design versus diffuse design. Diffuse design, I think, is, is kind of what happens when you wake up in the morning and, and, and get dressed. It's like, you know, you're your own designer. You make some kind of random or maybe more conscious choices about what to wear, what to, what to express, uh, what to project into the world in, in the way you, you are. You make choices about your furniture, make choices about where to live. Uh, those are all, in a sense, design choices. That's diffuse design. Diffuse design is also social innovation when you see groups of uh, citizens coming together to uh, create change. There's design processes involved in all of that. But in, the, in, in, in a context of diffuse design, and that design is everywhere, of course, we're also seeing design being consolidated somehow. And uh, I'm just wondering if anyone knows um, what these uh, companies have in common. They got bought, or they partnered up, or integrated, or collaborated, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, but yes, that's what they did. And, uh, and uh, some of them, of course, are here today, as you all know. And that's, you might call, is, I would say that's really interesting. On the one hand, it's really, really interesting because this understanding of design's importance means that large corporations and consultancies, some of the most respected companies on the planet, are hiring, buying up, leading design firms. Others would say, now what? Is that gonna be, are those gonna be marriages made in heaven? 
or those going to be something else? Um, I don't know what the, will happen yet. The jury is still out. Finally, about design context, there's expansion into new fields, new areas. This is not just about diffuse design, but it's also about expert design being used in new sectors. We just heard a great example from healthcare. Uh, this is, um, does anyone know where this photo is from? Berlin, Berlin yes, the, Berlin, the, uh, the German Reichstag. Uh, and the reason I chose this is because even uh, Chancellor Merkel in Germany is setting up a small design team. She doesn't really call it that, and I think though, there might be more anthropologists than designers in there. But the notion is we need to work systematically on how humans, how citizens experience services from the absolute top of the German government. We need to have that kind of insight, that kind of behavioral, rich, qualitative insight. Uh, so design is finding its way, and as many of you know in the room here, a lot of, a lot of friends and colleagues in the room, uh, design labs, uh, design studios are proliferating across governments all over the world. So there's an expansion also in terms of sectors and areas and domains, city level at, at government level. And finally, you might say that design is also splintering. Uh, a, a positive way of saying it might also be that design is becoming much more nuanced and precise in various professions. Service design is one strand, a major strand, but there are many, many other ways you might articulate what design is um, moving towards in terms of, uh, of a professional practice. So this splintering, I think, has some dilemmas. And the reason, by the way, I, ch I chose this is that last year's uh, issue of, uh, of Wired, the design issue, really, um, uh, in a sense, uh, art art articulated uh, how, how design is so different. We heard earlier about Airbnb. So Airbnb is also a case example, uh, as a design case example in, in, the, in this issue. But so is uh, Nike uh, and the use of new materials for, for uh, in the next generation of sneakers. Uh, and so is the New York Times and how they work with data visualization and set up uh, studios and labs to work systematically with, uh, with data and uh, visualizing uh, news, news flows, for example. Uh, and finally, there's also a story about a 3D printer and how the maker movement and 3D printing is also transforming how we design. So just within that issue, I think there's like a, like a real, real broad understanding of what design might mean and what it is today. And so you see this, if not splintering, you see this, these stretches of design from craft to, to uh, designers being, uh, being the, uh, the partners in, in mass consumption and mass production. Uh, you're seeing uh, discussions about, well, what, what's the role of the individual creative designer versus versus co-design and service design? Uh, are, are we leaving out our craft, our practices uh, for just facilitating and orchestrating uh, collaborations with service designers? Uh, where does that leave the designer's position uh, in innovation work? Uh, product design versus service design, right? So, so, uh, so are we designing products or services? Are, are services, in a way, different kind of products? Uh, how do we create service product systems? Um, uh, we'll, we'll hear later, I think, in the conference about the Internet of Things and how uh, products are becoming more and more connected. And finally, uh, again, this, uh, this growth of, uh, or the spreading of design, uh, is design for growth or is it for social good? Uh, or is it both? And how might we, uh, we maybe integrate uses of design that are both generating profit but are also benefiting uh, the planet? So the question that we're kind of asking at the DDC in Denmark is, so what are the ways in which design can and would create value in society going forward? Uh, what are the ways that, that we should be curious about and interested in design uh, for society, uh, given that we have a mission that is to uh, help accelerate and spread the take up of design and business. So the macro and the micro, I would say, is that there are some consequences about this for uh, design, both at a policy level or at a, at a societal level, but there's also consequences of how we uh, run or engage with design from a leadership or management level. So I'll just try to share uh, those two perspectives with you um, over the next, uh, next few minutes. So design policy, it so happens uh, that a lot of people in the room and uh, together with, uh, with me wrote a, a book about that not so long ago. Uh, so um, so uh, what we're trying to explore, what could design at a policy level mean? And uh, I think it, uh, as one reviewer said, uh, this is uh, the first book of its sort. It might, not, might not be, be the last one, but at least it's, it's a good start. And I don't know if that was a positive or negative review, but <laughs> I took it as a semi-positive. So, so this is kind of what we're asking. So how can we accelerate the uptake of design? Uh, and just to share a little bit about uh, where, where we're coming from, my office is in this uh, small yellow uh, building, which is actually, this, it's a rendering, but that building does exist. The building behind it, the big uh, glass palace, uh, uh, Rem Koolhaas, the Dutch uh, architect's uh, design, uh, does not exist yet, but it's, it's, it's coming up uh, right next door. And I can tell you, living next to a building project like this one, 
is kind of noisy. The contractor actually, the, or the, the philanthropy, uh, philanthropy Real Dania that is uh, funding the whole project, they actually bought the yellow uh, building just to be, be sure that nobody would complain about, about the noise. <laughs> so, 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 so being renters, we really can't complain too much. But once in a while you'll see people like flying across the windows because you'll have a big crane and you have people standing on stuff and moving things around and you're having a meeting and you look out the window and somebody's just flying through and some, some crane. It's pretty exciting. But what this is going to be is going to be a powerhouse for Danish architecture design in the built environment when it's finished in 2018. And uh, in a sense, just to say that, uh, you know, going back to that Viking image, we're fortunate to live in a society, in a, in, in a country where we're pr prepared to make massive investments in, in, in strengthening design and architecture. Uh, and behind the building is not just the philanthropy, but also the, the state of Denmark and also the city of, uh, city of Copenhagen. This is the waterfront in, in, in Copenhagen where it'll be, it'll be located. Uh, maybe we can run a, run a service design conference at some point uh, in that space. That will be a pretty good auditorium, I think. <laughs> all right, you're all invited. That was a very expensive promise right there, right? <laughs> uh, so, so this is what we want to do. And uh, a new survey from, from, from the European Commission just showed that only 15% of businesses in Denmark consider that uh, the design is a strategic issue or a, a high-level strategic issue for them. Uh, however, those kinds of surveys, we've got to be a bit careful. This is a European-wide survey. Is anyone in the room from Greece? Great. Because... <laughs> Then I can say something uh, uh, maybe not so positive about Greece, which is that Greek companies answered uh, to the question, do you use design strategically across the whole company? 48% of businesses said, yes, we do. And I find that really a bit hard to believe. It shows how you've got to take those surveys with a little bit of uh, grain of salt, I think. So design squared. So when I came to the Danish Design Center about a year ago, I thought, being the design center, you kind of need to use design for, for promoting design. So can you follow me? So design squared, it's like, you want businesses to use more design, you may want to show how you do it yourself as a role model so businesses can see that you actually take it so seriously that you do it yourself. So how might you use design for policy or design for societal impact as an organization, as an institution that is, uh, as we are, part government funded, uh, that you might call design squared? So of course, it's about taking tools of service design, uh, design games, design artifacts. It's about using those tools to engage businesses. It's to, uh, when we explore how businesses are using design, uh, make it visual, make it concrete, uh, engage in dialogue and inquiry. Uh, it is, for example, like, like this example where some of uh, our colleagues have mapped this, the, the growth journey of a, design, a product design company, a fledgling, struggling product design company. How might we understand that growth journey? How might we find ways, the touch points with government systems, with finance, with new markets, with customers, ways where we might see uh, we could do a difference uh, in the future? What could other companies learn from their growth journey? How might we set up new collaborations between these types of businesses so they can learn from each other? All those kinds of things. Uh, powered by visualization, powered by uh, service design, basically. So what we do at the DDC is three things. So we want to do three things. And a conference like this is a, just a, such an excellent opportunity to mm, explore how we could do that. Because the first thing we want to do is ask good questions. Design centers and design institutions across the world have in many ways been set up to provide answers, to say, this is what design is. This is, what, uh, this is the value of design. Uh, here are the measurements, here, 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 here are the stories, here are the cases. And that's great, and we should also still be doing that. But for us, what's really important is to ask the new questions, given the changing context, given changing technology, given the diffusion of design, given the consolidation of design, what are the new questions we should be asking? And how might we experiment with those questions? So what we do at the DDC is we invite designers, design firms, and businesses to collaborate on stuff they haven't tried before. To collaborate, to try out, to challenge themselves on new questions about, you know, and you know, all businesses right now are saying, you know, we're disrupted by technology, we're disrupted by, by, by customers and, and or citizens that are not, you know, doing what we thought they, were, they would be doing. How might we set up experiments to really try out and test stuff? In complex social systems, you can't just do an analysis and write up a report and publish it. What you can do is you can probe and test and try stuff and learn from that. So the second thing that we're trying to do is to learn, to observe. So 
at the DDC, we're hiring ethnographers and anthropologists to go out and observe and watch what then happens. Everyone talks about you know, innovation, but for many, innovation is still a foggy, difficult concept. It's a bit of a black box. You know, The innovation stories we hear from leading companies are wonderful. They're great. They're always, they're always successful somehow. It's if we all say fail fast to succeed sooner, but we don't hear that much about the failures, do we? So what we, the deal we have is that when we fund these projects, or partly fund them, it's open source. You have to share, and you have to let us watch, and watch you fail, and watch you succeed. And you gotta let us share the slightly problematic stories as well. Because otherwise, how can we learn? And of course, finally, we do wanna share. We do wanna take those experiments and those cases and really share them across the system share them across industries, share them across government, share them across those actors, funders, policymakers who can make a difference to our society in the future. And sharing doesn't just mean publishing the cases. It probably wouldn't have to mean engaging, co-designing, workshopping, discussing, designing and changing systems that are supporting the uptake of design. So this is kind of the model prototype where we go small scale and then go large scale. And our role at the DDC is to basically start small and then begin to spread and build bigger and bigger programs across different platforms. Platforms we're working on, speaking of this morning, healthcare, cities, the future of advanced production, uh, to give three examples of the kind of strategic domains and areas where we believe design can have a huge impact and where there's both social good but there's also a market and a business potential. And one example, and this is only for the Danes in the room, but we actually run a big uh, uh, government program uh, on innovation and change where these companies can go in and actually get a uh, quarter of a million Danish kroner on funding for it. All right. So, micro design, design leadership. This is just to share some of the learnings that I had from my previous job where I was running MindLab, the Danish government's innovation team, and some of the learnings across a, a PhD, a doctoral uh, project that I'm also engaged in. Because even though we can talk about systemic change and the macro, we also need to discuss the micro, the, 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 the exact relationships between designers and organizations, between designers and leaders in organizations that are so crucial for making change happen. So bear with me, but now we're going into the micro, and this book will come in English as well in 2017, but there's, not a, there's no cover yet. So the cover is for, from a Danish book. It means uh, shape the future. But it's basically uh, a way to condense what have we learned about leading uh, service design projects, both within government and also there'll be quite a few uh, cases from business. What are we learning about what it takes to, to engage with designers and how can design leadership really be a tool for innovation? Anyone know who these two gentlemen are? Anyone? Old, old, old men, in black and white. Herbert Simon, yes, to the right. And Bucky Fuller, Buckminster Fuller to the left. So what's up with these two guys? I thought we, have a we had a lineup of mostly men this morning for keynotes, so I'll take two more men into the room just to, to finish the picture. I really hope we'll have a, a better gender balance in the next session. I think we will. But uh, anyway, a couple more men. Sorry about that. So what's with them is that for all that Herbert Simon has done for understanding the science of the artificial and understanding design, there's a very powerful strand in organizations, a very powerful strand in organizations that's about decision making. And design and service design gets framed in how do we use design to make smarter decisions, given context of problems. How can we solve problems using design? But for Buckminster Fuller, it wasn't so much about problem solving, it was about visioning. And I thought about some images that could illustrate visually what would design as decision making look like and what would design as vision making look like. Unfortunately, design as decision making is so boring, I couldn't find an image. The best idea I had was to give a, a, a photo of the book Administrative Behavior by Herbert Simon, from, which made him, helped him win the Nobel Prize, but that's kind of boring too, to give a, a book cover. I, I already gave you one, I won't give you more. So I thought about this one instead. 
and just show what Bucky Fuller was up to. No, that's future making or vision making. And that's not about providing a set of decision options. That's about saying what could the world also look like. So one of, uh, one of the best books I've ever read about design as, as management is uh, this one by Bull and Colopy. And I think we have to remember that design is about opportunity. It's not just about solving or tackling problems. It could be about envisioning, for example, what would a totally radically redesigned healthcare system look like? Or what could be a totally new way of starting a business or providing value in a certain market? And if we don't see design as that opportunity every single time, then I'm afraid we're going to forget the power of design. So you could also say that it's about asking the question, not just what decisions should we make, and this is what managers spend their time doing, also in, in, the, in, the, in the great uh, organization we just heard from. That's what I spend a lot of my time about, uh, on as a manager at the GDC. But we have to remember, when are we actually in a space, or when do we create spaces that are about what are we even making decisions about? Camille Miklowski grabbed this whole design attitude notion from Bolden and Colaby 10 years ago and explored it and wrote a PhD about it. And now there's a book called Design Attitude that's highly recommended, Design Attitude by Miklowski. And he says, well, actually, Design Attitude is about the professional culture of designers, and it's much, much more focused on opportunity creation. And just having these two strands in your minds as you work and consult or work within organizations, I think is, is, is important. Because we get dragged into decision making all the time. But how to carve out the spaces, for example, by setting up the studios, that very, very promising, I think, global ecosystem of studios at City. And when we do so, then, how do we get into the tough job of looking at what happens between design attitude and, design as, and, and decision making? What happens between designers and managers in that space that is actually also pretty full of friction? So just a few more minutes, I'll share with you some insights about what you might call not design attitude, but more I would call it design engagement. So how do leaders and managers engage with designers to create value? And the other way around, how does design, service design work impact and influence how, how, how managers think and act? That could also be the question, right? So here are, this is a reduced design process. It's only three dimensions. I'm sorry about that. I mean, four, of course, is better. And I actually, the other day, I heard a local government in Denmark, they have six steps in a design thinking process. Uh, writing a PhD about this, it takes, takes, takes way too long. So three is enough. You know, the three chapters, then it's, it's kind of more manageable. Exploring the problem space, the ethnography, the design research generating new ideas in the ideation phase, and of course, making the future concrete, making things that are visible and tangible. Those are, those are three core, core domains of designers. Those are ways in which design adds value, and not necessarily in that order, right? Often designers would start with prototypes, start with, with t trying stuff out, and then learning from that, and maybe going uh, back into new ideas again. So these three uh, domains are not, it's not like phases, it's not a linear thing, as we all know. But the six engagements, challenging assumptions, leveraging empathy, and so on, let me just go through those briefly just to share with you what are the ways in which managers, these are the ways in which managers are engaging with the designer work. And, th and then, by the way, the empirical data here about 15 service design projects across government organizations in five countries, the US, UK, Finland, Denmark, and Australia. Exploring the problem space. So here's, you know, it's just managers who are open and ready to have their assumptions challenged. And the engagement or you know, the success of design projects are just really, really powered by managers who are ready to have their eyes opened. One manager I spoke to, she runs, uh, actually she runs the heart clinic in, a, in the Danish National Hospital. She said, it's like, you know, those cracks in the tiles in your bathroom that, that's been there for, 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 for forever. And now I see them for the first time. Now I see them for the first time. And in her case, it was because she discovered through a service design project that they were really, really unprofessional in how they cared for their patients. Or leveraging empathy. 
managers who successfully engage with service designers are really, really concerned with users, let's call them customers, with citizens, and they put them first. And when push comes to shove, they put them before their staff. When push comes to shove, they're ready to let staff go. If staff, the team, colleagues are not ready to take the consequences of the insight they're getting. And the most of the service design projects I've seen in government that are really transformative and are, are get implemented, about 10% of staff can't deal with it. And about 10% of staff somehow have to find something else to do. The second um, dimension of design, generating alternative scenarios. This is where it gets really tricky. And this is where the decision-making instinct of managers kicks in. Because this is about opening up the opportunity space for really, really crazy ideas and allowing them to be um, in play for a while. That's really, really hard. So how do we, this is to quote uh, Marco Steinberg from uh, formerly Helsinki Design Lab, how do you steward the process? How do you give direction to a process where you don't know what the outcome will be, where you don't know where you're gonna end? How do you suspend decision making without losing total direction. And the managers who are successfully engaging with designers are actually able to do that and tell their teams, I don't know exactly where we're going, but we're gonna get there. And this is where designers, if they are able to articulate the process, can create the trust and the commitment uh, to allow the process to unfold. And what happens when the, when, when the managers let the process of service design unfold is that that is wonderful. This is a principal of a high school in Denmark who led her team of about, it was nine leading teachers across different disciplines in the school who collaborated for three months without knowing where they were going. And, when, and they asked her, so you were really not controlling us? You were really not, no, you, didn't ha you hadn't made up your mind? You hadn't made a decision? And she said, no, I hadn't. I really, really hadn't. And it was great but it was also very, very tough. Finally, enacting new practices. So how do we shape and make and do things and make them concrete and tangible? For me, that's at least, and I'm not an educated designer, I would say that is the most powerful part of design is the ability to make things, services, processes, artifacts, digital or, what, or physical, concrete. And this is a quote from a new project we're running with a Danish business, where the manager and the leaders involved in that business, the service business that works in recruitment, are ready to create something in 25 days. And when they create something, it's not an app, it's not just a tool, which it's also an app, it's also a physical tool, but it's also a new business model, and it's also a new business. And that business is now launching here in December as a whole new brand, a whole new team in that company, created in 25 days. The kind of courage and engagement and that mindset on behalf of the manager and of course also on behalf of the design team, the design consultancy um, 1508 from Denmark, was critical in making this happen and believing that it could happen in just that time. Finally, insisting, again, for, the, for managers to insist that everybody can win it's not just about disrupting the organization, disrupting the, the relationship with, the, with clients or, or, or with citizens. It's about creating better organizations that are better for staff, better for teams, and are better for creating the outcomes uh, that you want to create. So insisting that both sides need to benefit. And yes, it might be that the transformations in the business are so big that not everybody can be part of it, but those that are part of it need to be, feel that this is also an improvement in their lives. It's also empowering them to create great and better services. In one case at uh, MindLab, uh, which I ran uh, previously, uh, we could see that we could get a 23 to one return on investment if we calculated both the benefits to the organizations, the government organizations and the, and the efficiencies there, but also the improvement in business experiences on the, on the user side, 23 to one. That can only happen if you insist that everybody needs to win. All right. Maybe this could be a, uh, an opener for the, uh, for the panel debate. At least I think this is the critical thing. In organizations, there's a place where design ends and implementation begins, or actually design and implementation often go hand in hand. But what about the organization? And if designers aren't, I think, 
articulate and literate about what happens to organizations as all these things unfold, then ultimately we can be successful. Thank you. Thank you.